And listen, I just wanted to come by to say thank you. Um, we've been through a lot in our nation over the last couple of years. And the amen of Omega Sci-Fi, as always, as I have known you my entire life, I feel, have been leaders, national leaders, on so many important issues. And including what you all did to elect Joe Biden and to elect me as Vice President of the United States. I can do it. at the Boule in Orlando, I was talking about how our sorority with so many of our sister sororities, the Divine Nine as a whole, really organized folks around that important election. And you know, now we're 110 days out from a midterm. That is so critically important. And if you don't mind, I'll talk just a little bit about that because I'm here to also, yet again, come to you to ask for your leadership and to thank you in advance for what I know you've already planned to do. 110 days out. And right now, I'll just be very frank with you, we need to elect two more senators in the United States Senate who are willing to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and the Freedom to Vote Act. Willing to take seriously and pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. Who will stand up for the Women's Health Initiative Act. Right here in North Carolina, Sherry Beasley. Yeah. Who can win? Yeah. I was just in Pennsylvania, John Fetterman. Right? Who can win? And if we pick up some seats, then during the course of our administration, we can really see through what we got started. But because of all that you did as leaders who then inspire other leaders, we did win in 2020 because we convinced people based on our good word and the standing in community that it would matter, and it did. You know, I was just over, I was with the governor of North Carolina, Roy Cooper, we were talking about it. Our administration was able to extend the child tax credit, which is why we were able, in the first year, to lift over 40% of black children in America out of poverty. Yes. We were able to pass a tax cut for working families of up to $8,000 a year, which means more money in their pocket to pay for school supplies and medication and food for their children. We put over $5 billion into our HBCUs because we know they are the epitome of We have, through our Delta sister, Marsha Fudge, Secretary Marsha Fudge at HUD, taking on one of the long-standing civil rights issues, which has been fair housing, and looking at issue beyond what we know has been the historic and current issues of things like redlining, but also one of the issues that has received more attention because we are handling it, which is racially biased home appraisals, yes. knowing that our families, our greatest source of wealth and intergenerational wealth, meaning passing it from the grandparent to the children to the grandchildren, is home ownership. However, with home appraisals, we still have an issue. You all have heard the stories. Those stories of a black family trying to sell their home, and then the appraiser comes in and appraises the home for what they know is undervaluing the home. So they have friends in the family who are a white family, so they invite that family to come in and put up their family pictures and take down the black family's pictures. Home appraiser comes in, all of a sudden, the appraisal is much higher. Racial bias and home appraisals, which then directly impact the ability of a black family and by extension the community to pass on intergenerational wealth. These are some of the things we've been taking on. But there is so much more to do. And so I'm here to ask you to help us with this. Because there is so much at stake. You look at states like Georgia, like Texas. You look at what's, what, what some of these folks in, in North Carolina are doing, in South Carolina are doing, to attack the right people to vote. And you know why they're doing it? You can see a direct link between what Omega Psi Phi and so many others did to increase the voter turnout, which was 
record highs, and the backlash. But the backlash that they saw folks who weren't turning out before turned out, and then all of a sudden, after the election, among those who are denying and lying, frankly, excuse my word, but lying about who won the election, by the way, we won. <laughs> well, maybe a way to do it is to pass laws that, for example, now in Georgia, make it illegal to give folks food and water if they're standing in line to vote. Passing laws to make it more difficult to vote around trying to get rid of drop boxes. Why do we need drop boxes? Well, if you are a single father or a single mother and you've got the three kids, bad, bad kids in the back seat, and you know you want to go vote, you know you can't get out and stand in line to vote for, and wait for four hours, but you can pack the kids in the back seat after the night before you filled out your ballot and then drive over to the drop box, drop it off, and keep driving, right? Yep, yep, very fair. And these are the kinds of things, the details that matter about what we are up against. And so I'm here to thank you and to ask you that we continue to educate as is the history of this so important fraternity, to always educate the people about what is at stake and to inspire through the model of your success in leadership, to inspire people to see what is possible and to also remember who we are, who we have been, and who we're going to be. Amen. Amen. Because that is who this organization is. And one last point that I'd like to raise um, is the issue of choice. Because I need your help, and I'm just having a candid conversation here, about how we are going to talk with our young men about this. Because I think it is very important that we not leave our young men out of any conversation that is of national importance. And I think it's important to also recognize and agree that one does not have to abandon their faith or their beliefs to agree that a woman and not her government should make decisions about her whole body. Amen. So, it may not be your choice, it may not be the choice for your family, but the government should be in the business of making that decision for her. And, and, I, and I'm here to ask for your help because it is about our sisters and our daughters and our mothers and our aunties. It is about seeing that also on the issue of maternal health, it's something I've been working on for years, the issue of black maternal mortality is real, which is that black women are still in this country three times more likely than other women to die from pregnancy related issues, a lot of it which has to do with an inability to have access to the kind of care she needs. And so when we think about how black women are experiencing the health care system in America, we know it's an issue for all of us. And it's something that we should weigh in to address. Not to mention, you know, my goddaughter is 17 right now and she's applying to um, to college, and she knows she's pledging AK wherever she goes. <laughs> With all due respect to everybody else. <laughs> and, but she, she, I was talking to her, she was like, Auntie, um, I'm not I gotta now look at which states I'm looking at in terms of where I'm gonna apply for college. That's real. Right? So I would ask us to think, because I would like your help in terms of on my, at my stage and my platform, Let's make sure that we're not leaving anyone out of this important conversation. Because it is front and center as a very real issue in our country. And I can't emphasize it more than sharing with you my experience as Vice President, which is I've been traveling around the world. Um, I just was just yesterday, or the day before, with um, the President Zelensky's wife, Madame Zelenska. Um, I met him two days before the invasion of his nation when I was in Munich giving an important talk there about the integrity of what should be a, a, a global priority around sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, but what I can tell you is this, I've probably talked to, I've had at least 80 conversations 
in person or by phone, with presidents, prime ministers, and kings, some of whom I've hosted at the official residence of the vice president. We as Americans hold ourselves out to be a leader. We walk into these rooms, chin up, shoulders back, proud, openly proud, of the fact that we hail from a democracy, one of the greatest in the world, flawed though it may be, imperfect though it may be. And people around the world watch us because we are a role model. And each of us knows what that's like in our personal lives to be a role model. It means people watch everything you do to see if what you do is consistent with what you say. And they're right now saying that the United States Supreme Court, the, cur the court of Thurgood, mm -hmm. took a constitutional right that had been recognized from the people of America, the women of America. So when we're looking at an issue like this, when we're looking at an issue like voting rights, and what is happening in our country, let's also understand it's not only about an attack on the rights that we have been leaders on, but it is an attack on our democracy. And in that way, it also extends to an attack on our standing around the world when we walk into these various rooms talking about the need for protecting human rights and standing up for democratic principles of rule of law. So we got a lot of work to do. And this fraternity has always been front and center on all of these issues. And so again, I'm here to say thank you. Thank you, thank you. Enjoy the conclave. And, and thank you, Dr. Mary, for inviting me to come by and speak with you for a minute. Thank you all.